Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. Today we're going to talk about the shader system. Okay, so before we jump into any of that, I want to really quickly thank the partners of the channel, which is the highest tier of membership, as well as the highest tier on Patreon. So our partners are Aarslia, Wenchang, Caden, and Joel. Thank you guys so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. I also want to give a big thanks to all the other folks here that are listed on the screen at the moment. The support from you guys means a lot to me and helps me grow this channel and be able to make investments into the channel. So before we jump into that, I want to talk about sort of the current state of shaders, if you will. Until now, shaders have been super rigid in structure, and they've also made lots of assumptions. These are a couple of major things that we want to fix, because in order to have a shader system that is capable of expanding upon and flexible, some of these things are going to have to change. And we did some of these things just to get stuff up and running, but now it's time to sort of revisit this and make it a lot better. So what are our requirements for our shader system? Well, what we want is a new shader system that is able to load from configuration, some sort of configuration, whether that be in code, which is what we're initially gonna do, or uh, from files. And uh, eventually we might even support this from an editor. So we need something that's capable of doing that. We also want a shader system that uses generic shaders. So we want little to nothing to be hard-coded within the shader system. We also want something that is extensible, something that's easy to modify, easy to extend, and of course, easy to maintain. And so we need to combine the concepts of the current shaders that we have into one flexible, configurable structure. So right now we have our material shader and our UI shader, and we need to sort of take those two concepts and combine the differences between them and make them configurable by providing parameters and flipping flags and so forth. So naturally, this means that it's time for the refactor tractor. So we're going to accomplish this in several different phases because this is actually kind of a big part of the system and it's going to be a little bit of work to actually get this going the way that we want it to go. So we've divided this into a few phases. Phase one, we're going to create a new generic configurable shader. So right now, since we only have Vulkan as a backend, that is the one that we're gonna support. Phase two, we will take the material and UI shaders out and we'll replace them with this new structure and remove those old files from our code base. We're also going to update the backend to use this new structure. Phase three, we're going to set up a new shader system that manages all shaders in the system. So basically it's going to be a system where we provide it a name, maybe the paths to various configuration files, our spur v binary files, things of that nature. And then the system goes out and stands that up, performs the initialization, um, maybe even does a reflection pass, things of that nature. But for right now, we're going to keep it super simple, and it's simply going to just manage the shaders in the system and flipping back and forth between them, keeping track of which one's active, that kind of thing. And finally, in phase four, we are going to update our material system to be more dynamic, and we're going to tie it to our material system, and we're going to do that through uh, shader slash configuration. So currently, our material system uses sort of an enumeration and a bunch of if-then checks to determine what shader should be used depending on the material type. We're not gonna do that anymore. We're actually going to tie a material to a shader so that materials are more flexible, where we still have that sort of built-in material type, but we can also define other material types when we're actually defining a material. And those will automatically be tied to a existing shader in the shader system. 
and whenever the material goes to get used, it will automatically make that connection under the hood and we won't have to worry about it. So for this video, we're going to focus on phase one. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have four different videos for this. I suspect some of those other phases will probably be combined. So I'm thinking that we're probably going to wind up with two, maybe three videos out of this, okay? But for this video, we're gonna focus on phase one. So the first thing that we're gonna do is provide an overview of how a generic shader will work. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about features and cover some assumptions that will still be present even after the refactor, as well as we're going to review the code for the generic Vulkan shader. So I wanna talk about branching real quick because this is something that is going to come up over and over again. And this is the first time that we have a really large feature that we need to implement. So we need to talk about branching in terms of Git. So because this is a big change, we're going to do this in something called a feature branch. And anytime you're working on a code base that is somewhat large, especially when other people are using it and relying on it, you generally don't want to implement something that's halfway done, that's a breaking change where the application won't run. You generally want to implement something called a feature branch. So for those of you who aren't familiar, in Git you have something called the main branch or Sometimes it's called the master branch. And anytime you add a new feature to the application, you create a new branch off of that main branch. And you develop the feature on that branch of code. And then when that feature is complete, you merge it back into main, right? So you can have technically multiple features going at the same time. So this feature branch is something that we are going to wind up using for this because this actually spans multiple videos and we will not be able to run the application until this is actually complete. So none of this will actually wind up being merged into the main branch until this feature is complete. So feature branches obviously provide us with a few things. As I said, it allows us to have large changes without breaking the main branch. It allows features to be developed in tandem. It allows for a clear merge path of new features into the code base, as well as a nice history as to what was done. And eventually we might implement a full system of pull requests and whatnot, so that these can be tied to work items within Git. As we make this much larger, we're going to eventually want to do that as we start planning out our features and so forth. So this is sort of the first step in a direction of trying to treat this more like a professional project that is being managed. We have a few different branch types that we're gonna wind up with. We've already discussed the feature branch here. So typically we'll have a branch that's named feature forward slash feature name. And this is for new features that are going to be added to the engine. We'll also have bug fix branches and these are pretty self-explanatory. They will be called bug fix forward slash bug description. And those obviously are for bug fixes only. We don't put features in bug fix branches and we don't put bug fixes in feature branches typically, unless we happen to kind of spot something along the way. We're also gonna have something called refactor branches. And those will simply be named refactor forward slash description. And those are usually for refactorings that are not a new feature or a bug. It's just something that we've kind of identified that needs to be refactored. And then of course, we'll have other branches along the way for things like PRs that are done by third parties, documentation or other minor changes to like readme files or things like that that don't necessarily fall under these categories, right? But we'll try to keep those to a dull roar. So now let's talk about our shader uniform structure. So we have different scopes of our shader uniforms, and this is going to be something that is gonna be integral to the way that we actually are going to be refactoring this. So the first scope that we have is globals, and those typically have a single uniform descriptor. They are held in a single uniform buffer object. They also can potentially have a combined image sampler descriptor if we are actually using global textures. 
So an example of something that would be global would be either global textures, which is would be a texture that's used uh, across the board, or we would have something like projection or view matrices, which is far more common. The next scope is instances, and this is where we have instance level uniform descriptors. And at this point, it's going to be one uniform buffer object per instance. We can also have combined image sampler descriptions if we are actually using textures at the instance level. So there's always gonna be globals available, but we have the option to use instances. We don't necessarily have to use instances. We're going to make that optional. But uh, if we do have them, we can have uh, UBOs and we can have image samplers. An example of this would be a material instance. So we've seen material instances in our code base. And so we would have instance data or textures at the instance level for our instance scope. Next, we have locals and locals are even further scoped down than that. So locals will typically use push constants. That'll be one per object. You can think of this as for model matrices, which is actually what we're using it for right off the bat, or for one for every object in the world. Here's another way to visualize how the scopes work. So at the outermost scope, we have our uniforms, which is our least frequent updates. That's our projection view matrix. For example, we have our instance uniforms, which are pretty frequent in terms of how often they're updated. And that is, for example, our material instance data. And then we have our local uniforms, which is updated for every local object, i.e. a model matrix. So the further we go into scope, the more often these are updated. And that is why we have the scopes. That's why these things are separated. Because these descriptors at the global level don't need to be updated very often. Whereas these ones at the instance level need to be updated much more often. So it doesn't make sense to be updating all of them all the time when we can sort of optimize and split them up this way a little bit. So now we'll talk a little bit about shader lifecycle because this is going to be very similar to what we had, but also different in several different ways. So our shader lifecycle will consist of two primary stages. We'll have the engine initialization stage, and then we'll also have every frame. So typically when we create shaders, that'll be at the engine in it. Eventually we'll probably wind up creating shaders during runtime, although we'll try to keep that to a dull roar. So within engine init, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a shader. And this is just creation, standing up of internal variables with defaults, things of that nature. It's not actually usable at this point. It's just created. The next thing that we'll do is something that we'll call define, where we add our attributes, our uniform, our sampler definitions, and we'll generate some internal configuration that we'll use for the next stage, which is initialization. This is where we actually acquire the GPU resources as defined in our internal configuration that we defined in our define stage. So after the initialization is complete, the shader is actually usable. So within the every frame portion, we have the begin frame, which is where we start the render pass, we use the shader, things of that nature. We move on to bind our globals, where we set our global uniforms within that. So we'll set our projection and our view, view matrix, things of that nature. And then we'll go ahead and apply those globals. And that is where we update and bind the descriptors for the global uniforms. And then we'll repeat this process at the instance level. So we'll iterate the instances and, uh, for example, uh, material instances, and we'll bind and apply. And then we'll iterate the locals, which is the individual objects within the world. Uh, once per object, we'll go ahead and send up a model matrix. And that's kind of the shader life cycle. It's a very high level view of it, but uh, that is what the shader life cycle looks like. So I do want to point out that in this design, there are still assumptions that we're going to make. So the first assumption is going to be that global uniforms are always housed in a single UBO. Instances always have one UBO each for their uniforms. 
and local uniforms always use push constants. These are assumptions that we're making. And that's okay. We have to draw the line in the sand somewhere. If we don't do these things and we don't make some of these assumptions, then we're going to wind up having such a complex system that we're going to have to run all these checks and do all this extra work, and it's going to take us that much longer to get up and going. We can always add those things later, but for right now, that's kind of where I'm drawing the line in the sand. So what exactly will our UBOs look like? Because before we had a structure in code, literally defined in a C struct, as to how those UBOs will look, and then we are loading those into a buffer. We're not gonna have that now. This is going to be very dynamic. So we're gonna have what we're gonna call a UBO block, and it's gonna have a running offset that starts at zero. And every time we add a uniform to it, we're going to go ahead and keep track of that offset and the size. So for example, if we add a vector three, which is 12 bytes, uh, that will have a offset of zero. If we then add a vector four, which is 16 bytes, that'll have an offset of 12 because that is where this one ended and this one begins. If we were to add, say, a vector two, we would have a eight byte uniform with an offset of 28, etc. Okay? And the reason that we can have this sort of structure is because this is very linear, right? Once we add uniforms, we're not going to have the ability to take them away because that doesn't really make sense. So we can maintain this linearly and we can have this offset that sort of runs from start on, on to finish. And this all works because the UBO block is nothing but a void pointer. So it can be any shape of data that we want. And since these are stored in the order that they're added, each uniform has its own internal offset and Whenever we go ahead and apply a uniform, all it does is go to the offset and does a memory copy into the memory block at the appropriate location. So what about attributes? They work exactly the same way as UBOs, with an offset, but without the block of memory. So we don't have a void pointer because they don't use buffer storage. The way that attributes are actually loaded in is it's all loaded in as one blob, attributes simply tell the shader what is where. So we only actually have to do that setup once and we don't have to manage it. But the same principle basically applies. We have a offset and that offset increases along with the size as you add attributes. Okay, so that is the overview. Let's go ahead and take a look at some code. So I have here vulcanshader.h and vulcanshader.c. And these are the two files that we're gonna be reviewing in this video. So vulcanshader.h, I will really quickly go over sort of the interface. And you'll note that I have thoroughly documented this file in terms of what all these individual functions do. So I'm not going to do a deep dive on this. This is simply going to be an overview. And then when this is released, if you guys are interested in the details, please have a look at the code. Uh, I've gone ahead and documented it both in the front and in the internal uh, definition. So the first thing that we have is our create, where we take in a bunch of parameters to create the shader. The most important ones are obviously the name, the render pass that the shader is going to be associated with, what stages it's available in, uh, this max descriptor count, uh, descriptor set count rather, is the max number of descriptor sets that can be allocated from the shader. So this generally needs to be a very, very high number. Whether or not we're going to use instances, whether or not we're going to use locals, and remember that I said that both of those are optional. You always have globals, but you can optionally not use instances and locals. And then of course a pointer to hold the shader, okay? The other thing that I want to point out is we only pass the context in to create. We actually wind up storing a pointer to the context within the shader itself so that we don't have to pass the context all over the place. So we only need to provide the context during creation. We obviously have destroy. So the next thing we have is this section here to add attributes, samplers, and uniforms. And I've grouped these together because they all 
sort of come after the create stage, but before the initialization stage. So this is sort of still in the setup stage. So what we do is we come through here and we add our attributes. And uh, we have our shader attribute types, which are actually defined in our Vulkan types INL. So if we take a look at that, we have all of these types that are defined here. And these loosely get translated to Vulkan types under the hood. Uh, eventually, uh, this probably should be moved. I've got a to-do there. But uh, what we have is all these different types here. Like if we have uh, a float32 for an attribute or uh, a float32 uh, times two, which would be for a vector two, or one for a vector three, one for a vector four. We have our matrix four here. We have our integer types, our unsigned integer types of all different sizes, okay? And so whenever we add an attribute, all we do is we pass the shader, a name for the attribute, and then the attribute type, which also tells us the size of it. And there's an internal lookup table that looks at the type and determines size based off of that. We also have something here to add a sampler. This is when you add a sampler for a particular scope. And it should be noted that samplers may only be added to a global and instance scope. You cannot add a sampler to a local scope because samplers cannot be used with push constants. It makes no sense. So you can only use these at the instance or global level. And this does have logic in it to check that. So here's how you add a sampler. Again, you just provide a name, a scope, and then a pointer to hold a location. So samplers and uniforms operate very similarly under the hood. They are stored in a similar manner. This out location is used to index into an internal array for a quick lookup as to where the offset of that particular sampler is. So we don't have to look it up by name all the time, we're actually given a index to provide back when we go to load that. And I'll show you guys that here in a second. But when whenever you add a sampler or a uniform, you store a output integer as to that sampler or uniforms location. So uh, since I've already mentioned that, uniforms work basically the same exact way. So whenever you add a sampler or a uniform, it's doing almost exactly the same thing, providing an out location. So all these uniform functions are the same just for all the various types. Okay, so I'm going to actually skip past those until we reach the end of the add attributes samplers uniform section. Next we have initialize. So this basically takes all the uniform samplers and attributes that we've added and every time you add one of these things, they are stored in an internal configuration that's sort of built on the fly. This takes that internal configuration and it acquires the resources needed from the GPU to actually be able to utilize the shader. So after the shader has been initialized, it is actually fully usable. Here's the use function for that. Works exactly the same as it did before. Here is the bind globals. So it binds the global resources for use and updating. So generally speaking, you'll want to call bind globals first, and then you'll want to set the uniforms for globals, and then you'll want to move on to binding each individual instance by instance ID. This instance ID is provided when you acquire resources. We'll get to that in just a second. Of course, we have our apply globals and our apply instance. These two functions essentially take all of the values that were set after the bind global or bind instance were called and applies them within Vulkan by copying them over to either the UBO or the sampler or what have you. Okay, so before we actually move on to setting shader values, we should talk just a quick second about acquiring and releasing resources. So this works very much in the same way that it did before. The only difference is uh, we are now given an out instance ID when we acquire instance resources. And this basically acquires resources from the GPU such as your descriptors uh, and so forth. And what this does is provides you with an out instance ID, which is a again, a lookup into 
a lookup index rather into an internal array so that uh, whenever we call bind instance, we use that same instance ID. So what this does is it basically sets an internal pointer to a specific spot in the uniform buffer for that particular instance ID. And that is provided by this instance ID, which contains an internal offset and so forth. When you call this, you are setting the internal pointer to a specific position for this instance ID within the uniform buffer. So that is acquiring resources. Releasing resources is pretty self-explanatory. It basically just frees those descriptor sets. Vulcan shader uniform location is to allow a lookup for a uniform by name. So there's an internal hash table that is used that keeps all of the uniform names. This allows us to obtain the location uh, for a uniform name if, of course, that is successful. Otherwise, it returns an invalid ID. So if for some reason you forgot to store this off or we're kind of building one on the fly, uh, this is a way that you can do that, but you generally don't want to rely on that. You generally want to store that location when you actually add the uniform. Here we have our set sampler. So this takes in the shader itself, the location that you would have received when you added the sampler. So this is saying we want to set the sampler at this location to use the texture that's provided and it takes a pointer to a texture. And then we have all of our set uniform functions here. So we have one for I8, I16, I32, all of our integer types, our float types, our vector types, and so forth. So these all pretty much act the same exact way. They take in a location and a value. These vector ones also can take in either a vector two or there is a float variant that takes the elements individually. So there's one for vector two, one for vector three, one for vector four, and then finally matrix four. And that is the interface. So it is a lot of lines of code. Most of that is documentation comments just so that you can kind of see what you're doing as you're programming. Uh, but there's not a whole heck of a lot to this interface. It's just kind of understanding what the life cycle should be of a shader. And once you have that down, calling these methods and knowing when to call them is pretty straightforward stuff. So that is the interface. Now we're going to take a quick look at the shader code. So we're not going to do a deep dive onto this because if we scroll all the way down here to the bottom, we see that we are over a thousand lines of code. There is no way I'm reviewing a thousand lines of code here, right? So this is one of the reasons that we're doing this in a branch because there are a lot of changes here. So when we create the shader, we do some basic sanity checking. We go ahead and set out, uh, set or zero out all of our variables within the shader itself. So here is where we do the shader stages where we parse out the flags and we go ahead and set up the stage config for that. So this is building all of our configuration that we're going to need for the next stage. We zero out a bunch of the arrays just to be sure that everything is, is starting absolutely zeroed out. We don't have any garbage data. And there are a couple notes in here of things I want to touch on. There are some things that we uh, are making some assumptions on in here just because we need, again, to draw a line in the sand. One thing here is the internal hash table that is used for uniform lookups. It has an element count of 1024. That is way more uniforms than we will ever have. We never need that many uniforms. But as I've explained with hash tables, the larger the element count is, the less likely that we're going to have collisions within that table. So this doesn't cost us very much memory because all we're doing is we're actually storing U32s. And so this hash table essentially just stores a index into the array of uniforms that we have on the shader. And that's all it stores, right? So when, whenever we look up a uniform location, that is just the index into that array. And that is what this stores. So it doesn't cost us much memory at all to have that much of an element count. All right. The only other thing that I want to mention here is 
a slight to-do. This is something that I will expand on later. And I've mentioned this before that NVIDIA, some NVIDIA GPUs have a alignment requirement for UBOs where they have to be aligned to 256 bytes. So that is actually what uh, this is setting up initially. We also have a push constant stride, which is set to 128 bytes because that is all that the Vulkan spec actually guarantees. There are a couple of hacks that I have in place here. These are things that I want to expand on later on and will probably do so once we actually have our shader system up in place. But I'm making some assumptions that the the number of uniform buffers that we'll have is 1024 and the max number of combined image samplers that we'll have is 4096. Again, this will need to be changed. We don't necessarily need to have that many or maybe we might even need more given a particular shader, but for now, I'm just making uh, those assumptions. Here is where we set up our descriptor sets, or at least the configuration for those things. So we have our global ones here, and then we have our instance ones here if we are using instances. Destroy is pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to skip that. Whenever we add an attribute, we have a static lookup table here that gives us the Vulkan format and the size in bytes of that particular format. So this is that internal lookup table that I was talking about. This is done statically, so it only gets actually executed. Uh, this code, rather, only gets executed the first time it's run. And then after that, uh, this will obviously be defined. So we do that as sort of a, a little bit of an optimization so that we don't have to uh, you know, run this same code every single time. And then all we do is we go ahead and add the attribute. There's not a whole heck of a lot going in, on in here, so uh, I will go ahead and leave this for you guys to review. Adding our sampler just does some sanity checking to make sure that we're not doing it at the local level and to make sure that our, if we are doing it at the instance level, that our shader is also supporting instances. And then we do some valid checking against the uniform name to make sure it actually exists, to make sure it's not an empty string, things like that. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and set up our descriptor sets for it. And again, this is, since we're just adding here, all we're doing is creating configuration at this point. So once we get here, uh, we're basically going to take a look at the set configuration for the given a uh, descriptor set. Uh, this set index is actually determined by whether we are global or instance. Global is always going to be the first descriptor set. Instance is always going to be the second descriptor set. So we just have some hard-coded constants here. Uh, and this is another one of those assumptions that we're making, but again, it simplifies our code and it's a pretty safe assumption uh, to make that we're always going to have this configuration. So here we go ahead and say, if we have not yet set up a binding for instance, we go ahead and set up the bindings for that. Otherwise we go ahead and add a sampler to that simply by upping the descriptor count. All right, and uh, I actually just noticed here that I have, I have a slight bug here. Uh, this is saying if global push into the list, but then it's checking against local. So let's go ahead and fix that. All right, and I'll go ahead and make sure that that makes it over because I didn't see that before. All that does is just assign to an array of global textures that we store on the shader itself, which is just pointers to textures. And we just assign the default texture to that. Uh, we do the same thing at the local level as well, right? So if we're adding a sampler at the global level, we go ahead and perform that operation. Otherwise, we go ahead and we only increment the texture count for the instance. Uh, because if it's at instance level, these are not stored on the shader, but they're stored within the instance state. Here we have a bunch of function definitions for add uniform, etc. So we have this macro here that sort of provides this shortcut for us so that we don't have to repeat this code all over the place. 
that verifies the uniform, that verifies we're in the proper state to be adding uniforms, because if we have already initialized the shader, we shouldn't be doing that. And then obviously make sure that the uniform name is valid. If any of those things fails, it goes ahead and return false, right? So it's a nice way for us to be able to keep this very concise. Otherwise, we return from a local private function called uniform add, where we pass all of this uniform name, uh, the size of the individual uniform, which varies by function, right? The scope, the out location, and then whether or not it is a sampler, which is always going to be false except for add sampler. This uniform add is what does all the work. Obviously, we don't want to be repeating this all over the place. So we do some basic sanity checking here. Here is where we have a uniform lookup entry. This is what we store an array of called uniforms on the actual shader itself. And we set that here. So depending on what scope we actually pass in and various other properties, we have a whole bunch of different properties that get set within those entries. Most of this stuff, I feel like I can leave you guys to sort of look through because a lot of it is repeats of stuff we've already seen. We're just kind of making this a little bit more dynamic. I've also commented this in terms of how this all actually works. There is something in here called get aligned range that we're doing because we want to make sure that if we are in a local scope, we want to make sure that all of our push constant ranges are aligned to four bytes. That is something that the Vulkan spec requires. So we are actually performing a get aligned range here. This is actually defined in our defines.h. So we have a get aligned and a get aligned range. So the get aligned range takes an offset, a size, and then the granularity that it should align to. So in other words, if we have a granularity of four and we provide a, well, let's actually take a look at this guy, right? So if we have a granularity of four and an operand of five, which means we have something that's five bytes and we need that to be aligned to a four byte interval, then this is going to wind up returning eight because that is the nearest multiple of four that will actually hold what we need to, right? So if that was one, then our answer would be four. If that was 11, then our answer would be 12 and so forth and so on. And so that is what this does. And then this does that same exact thing for a range aligning both the offset and the range. Next, we go ahead and we set the entry in our hash table. So we provide the hash table, the uniform name, and then the index of the entry. We go ahead and assign the entry to the appropriate uniform uh, count in there. And then we go ahead and increment that. So that is in the um, last position of the array. And then if it is not a sampler, we go ahead and check the scope and increase the UBO size, which is sort of the running size for every one of these things that we add. We increase that for either the global or the sort of instance UBO size uh, by the entry size for whichever one of those we, uh, whichever one of those scopes we are adding to. So that is add uniform. All these do the exact same thing. Our initialization essentially loops through our configuration creates our descriptor pool, our descriptor set layouts based on that. It pulls uh, some viewport information. This is another one of those places where we actually are going to want to update this eventually because we are making some assumptions here. And uh, this is this definitely feels wrong to have these here. This is something that we should be able to configure or pull. But at the moment, we're just gonna leave this as is because we actually need to uh, just get something up and working. So I put a to do here and we'll come back to it. Here's where we create all of our pipeline information. So we pass through our, all of our information as we did before, just now it's a little bit more dynamic. So we actually pass through um, our attribute stride or count, our attributes, our descriptor set uh, count, our descriptor set layouts, stage count, and so forth. So there have been changes to this Vulkan graphics pipeline as well. We will go over that probably in the next video. And then we check to make sure that, that was successful. 
we go ahead and get the closest valid stride for both the global UBO and the instance UBO. And that is basically to make sure that that alignment requirement that we have here, this UBO alignment requirement is met. And then we go ahead and we create our uniform buffer. We allocate space for the global UBO. And now we do a map for the entire buffer's memory. So this is another difference between the previous version and what we do now. Now we just map the entire block of memory to a void pointer. And we just offset within that pointer as to where we actually want to perform memory copies so that we don't have to do the whole create a staging buffer and upload and all that. We didn't actually need to do all that. So all we have to really do is just lock the memory, which allocates a block of memory and makes that uh, visible to the CPU so that we can memory copy to it. And we just leave it locked uh, as long as the buffer exists. Here is where we allocate the global descriptor sets, and then we go ahead and flip the shader state to say, hey, we're initialized. Use is the exact same. Bind globals binds what we have called a bound UBO offset to the global UBO offset. So when we create the uniform buffer object for the global level, uh, we take that offset, which is generally zero, and we are setting that to the bound UBO offset. This is that pointer to the UBO's block of memory that I was talking about that will change per instance. So speaking of that, we have our bind instance, which takes in the instance ID. The shader bound instance ID becomes that instance ID. We go ahead and grab the a pointer to the object state, which is the shader instance states at index instance ID. And then we set that internal pointer to the UBO offset to be the object state offset. And that's pretty straightforward stuff, okay? So uh, here's where we apply the globals, which is where we have all of our descriptor rights for the global information. Uh, I have not set up the information, I have not set up the samplers portion of this for the global yet. I need to actually come back and do that. So for now, I've put a to-do there and we'll error out uh, right away. We don't actually need this functionality, so I'm actually holding off on adding it. When we hit it, I'll come back and add it. Then we update our descriptor sets and bind our descriptor sets. And here is the instance version of that. The only difference between this and that is, uh, between this and the global rather, is uh, this one actually has both the UBO as well as the sampler support, right? So this sampler support will more than likely wind up almost being a copy paste up here, which is one of the reasons I didn't do this yet because I don't want to repeat myself. I'm probably going to make a private function that just does that for me. But uh, for now, uh, this is where that is done. So we go ahead and we apply that instance, right? And that's just all of the things that we've set up to that point. Here is our acquire instance resources. This works almost exactly as it did before, so there's not really much to talk about here. The only main difference is that when we acquire the resources, we go ahead and get the default texture and then set all of the instance textures for that particular instance state to the default te texture. So that way we're not having to grab this sort of on demand. It's already just sort of set up for us. We allocate some space in the UBO. This is where we get our instance offset from, and that pointer, or that offset is used to uh, change our pointer later on. And then we allocate our descriptor sets just as we did globally. And then we have our release resources, which is the, pretty much the exact same thing as we used to have before. Here's our set sampler. All this does is at the global level, a sets the pointer at the given location to T, which is in our which is our passed in texture. Or if it is not global, meaning it has got to be an instance, then it sets the instance texture at entry location to T for the bound instance ID. And this bound instance ID, this is why it's important to bind the instance before you call any of the set methods, because they all pretty much work the same way. Here's the implementation of the uniform location. As I mentioned before, all this does is 
performs a hash table lookup. Here's something to check the uniform size to make sure that the size at the location meets the expected size. That's just a little bit of internal validation that we do. Our set uniform essentially takes a look at the scope, gets the appropriate block of memory, whether that be the global UBO or a local UBO, or uh, if it is a local, just goes ahead and pushes it to the push constant. If it is not a local, in other words, it's not using a push constant, then whatever block of memory we attain here, we do a straight memory copy to that block with the value that is passed in for the given size. And that is it. It's really that simple to set a uniform. And then of course, all of our set uniform variants just call set uniform under the hood, passing in, of course, the appropriate size for that given type. So that's what all those do. Our create module is now done within this. So our shader utils file is gonna wind up going away because that is basically all that actually had. So that's all just been moved here. Here's our check to make sure the uniform name is valid. So obviously we make sure it exists, make sure it's not an empty string, make sure it doesn't already exist in our lookup table and then return accordingly. Here's where we check the given state of the shader to make sure it's valid to add a uniform. So basically the only state, the only valid state to add a uniform to is this Vulcan shader state uninitialized. So the available states are not created, which once we call create, then it gets moved to uninitialized. And then once we call initialize, it gets moved to uninitialized. So the only place we can actually add uniforms or attributes is this uninitialized state. And then our uniform add, which I touched on before. So that is the new shader implementation. As I mentioned before, this was not meant to be a deep dive. The code will be available to you guys on the repo. If you have any questions about it, feel free to ask in the comments below. And that is going to do it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please toss the video a thumbs up. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. And I will see you guys next time.